Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Peter, recovered alcoholic. Yeah. Uh, I'm grateful to be alive and sober and part of a sacred place called Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, just want to uh, let everyone know Jordan was married, just back from his vacation. All and, right, uh, so that's good stuff. The other reason I bring it up is because I was telling him before the meeting, it was him and a couple other guys uh, that I knew when they were first getting sober, and I looked at pictures of their uh, wedding uh, party thing in the tuxedos, and uh, I called Marion over, and I was looking at it on this website, and uh, I says, uh, these three guys, when I met them, should have been dead. And uh, one's get married, two others in, a, in the bridal party uh, suited up and looking like sober gentlemen. So it was, uh, it made me cry. It was, it was a thrill to, to see that um, because we know people when they first walk in and what happens to them as a result of this place called Aquawax Anonymous. So uh, congratulations. Um, I had a really interesting weekend. Uh, this past weekend I was uh, in a town called Lafayette, Louisiana, and um, to my surprise, uh, when I got there and uh, was at the registration desk and um, getting my badge and stuff, uh, I got a tap on the shoulder, and it was my great-grand sponsor, a guy by the name of Gary Brown, who sponsored me for about a year and a half, um, way back when, when things in my life were uh, kind of rough. And um, it was a thrill for me to get a hug like he gave me and a peck on the cheek from my great-grand sponsor, um, who's sober about 50-something years now and is uh, an icon uh, in the Midwest. Um, he just he's, he's done the deal. He's one of the guys responsible for a lot of you guys here, fellowship of the spirits floating around the country. He's the spearhead of the first one out in Colorado but doesn't tell anyone about it. A uh, man who walks with great humility. So it was a thrill for me to be around him and his uh, uh, folks who were sober around his age, 45 and 50 years sober, real good old time. Is, and uh, another guy named Bobby B. from Lafayette. These are all old-timers in the book. And sometimes we go to AA meetings and we don't see the real old-timers who are in the book. We see a lot of the young folks who are in the book. Uh, but these guys are big book monsters and, and, and but walked with a lot of humility. And for me, I was like a new kid on the block uh, with my elbows. And it's a, it was a treat for me to be around that stuff. And... Um, uh, got to listen to some of them share and, and have some coffee with them. So I'm kind of coming off of this this just fabulous weekend of a kid walking through Toys R Us. That's how I felt. It was just the pickings. And I just let them talk. I just sat there like a little student and just let them share their life experiences in Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, what I get to do is uh, share that with others and uh, kind of relight the flame a little bit. Gary Brown was sponsored by a gentleman named Paul Martin out of uh, Chicago, and Paul Martin was sponsored by Dr. Bob, and so I was able to touch my lineage when I'm around Gary B. and Bobby B. and Tom Ewell and some of these other guys. It's a real treat for me to be a part of that. I have a responsibility today uh, that's been handed down to me uh, from my teachers. And that's not to water down the message, and give away a gobbled message, give away a middle of the road message. And I don't know if I could do a good job of that or not, but that's certainly my intent. And sometimes when we're carrying this message in a big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, and we shared about this over the weekend, you will be revered and reviled in the same meeting, sometimes by the same people, depending on the slant of the talk. And we talked about meeting etiquette and how meetings should be treated as sacred, as they did way back when. So I'm grateful to be a part of that, I have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to pass on this message and not put anything before what's in the big book. Certainly not put anything before this power called God. Practicing fidelity to God, practicing fidelity to my, my loyalty to Alcoholics Anonymous. For me, it's the only game in town. There was a time in my life where I had other things more important than AA, and I kept getting loaded. And in 1988, when uh, uh, the power call God separated me from alcohol for the last time, I signed up as a journeyman on day one. I had no idea what I was in for. And it's about almost 26 years later that I'm still in this deal and still uh, uh, searching, still seeking, still hungry for uh, this message and the people who pass it on and are always approaching this with uh, the mind of a student, the beginner's mind, regardless 
of how long I'm sober. You can't teach an expert anything. So I approach this with the beginner's mind, open and willing to be changed. And sometimes the change doesn't feel good. Uh, sometimes it's, it's simple to change. You want to change. There's things hitting you and you want to just get rid of it, but not temporarily for good, permanently. And sometimes change is very, very uncomfortable because of the archway we're walking through. There's a squeezing. There's a narrow gate that we're going to pass. And six and seven talks about that. Actually, four through nine does it. Six and seven certainly takes what's left of five and squeezes it some more. But the one who's doing the squeezing to mold us out of this, this lump of clay is God. And so no matter how many times I'm pushed uh, to the edge and changed once again, as uncomfortable as it feels, doing the things I don't want to do, doing the things I'm not even sure if they're going to work, I chop wood and carry water and let God do what God's going to do. And so that's how I get here tonight. The process of recovery, um, although being recovered and being in the sunlight of the Spirit is certainly greater than using, certainly greater than a newcomer trying to find your way around AA without a GPS, um, but the process of recovery can be really uncomfortable at times. The belief system as well, I'm sober 20 years, I'm in the big book and everything is great, I'll hit Powerball, get the relationship, get a new car, and everything, I'm going to whistle down the block, and sometimes it's just the opposite. There's a lot of unknownness. I don't know if that's a word. I just invented it. There's a lot of uh, uh, mysteriousness. There's a lot of uncertainty when we walk this because for me, I've experienced things on this path that I never knew were coming at me and asked to uh, uh, take these leaps in recovery. And I found that there is no such thing as a leap of faith. It just feels like it's a leap. And when we enter the world of the Spirit in steps 10 and 11, you can't do that with a, a, a cognitive mind. You can't think your way into the world of the Spirit. You can't size it up. It's not logical, but we certainly enter it with an awakened spirit. That comes by way of 4 through 9. I mean, I can make meetings till the cows come home. I can sit 90 meetings a night. I can make 300 meetings in 90 days. And I may be just a little bit better than when I walk in. Not necessarily because of the meetings as they are. It's because I'm not drinking for 90 days. And I start to physically heal. I physically look better. I'm putting on weight. I'm even bathing and eating regularly. So physically, it looks like I've gotten better. But spiritually, I can be just as bankrupt or worse than when I was drinking. I can become very unpredictable. When I'm drunk, I'm not looking at 13-step anyone. I'm drunk. Just put me in a corner till I pass out. But for some of us, when we're, not, when we're sober and not drinking, we become predators. We become dangerous. Fear shows up. We used to drink the fear away. Suddenly I got fear. I got all these resentments. I don't know where they came from. Defects of character are driving me, and I worship them, and I defend them, and I protect them. And so what happens is I hit a wall another drink. Dishonesty is a regular occurrence in my life, and as long as I don't get caught, dishonesty is okay. When I get caught, I'm sorry. So the process of recovery is getting put through this really narrow archway. Our book talks about passing through the archway a free man or woman at last. It's interesting that they say uh, uh, at last because the way I interpret that and the way I've been shown is that there were many things I tried to do, even in AA, that I was looking to get some sort of freedom, and it came maybe in a relationship or money or different things, and I felt freedom for a little bit. I felt some relief for a little bit, but I wasn't free at last. At last means I've arrived at a place of freedom, and that can be permanent. Always searching, always looking to get some sort of relief, and I will tell you that the process of recovery will not give you relief. Going to a meeting will give me relief. Sitting with a couple of folks in a diner will give me relief and talking about my tales of woe. AA does not offer relief. What AA offers is freedom. There's a big difference between relief and freedom, and that's been my experience. When I was first uh, coming to Alcoholics Anonymous um, in 1988, I, my first time uh, going through the work and my last time drinking, my first six months was kind of upside down, and I run to a meeting to get some relief. You know, I talk to the old time as I get some relief, and there's that, that uh, uh, feeling really good when I left the meeting, the camaraderie of the fellowship, pats on the back and hugs, good to see you, and come back tomorrow, and then you get to the parking lot, and it starts all over again till the next meeting. So I got relief for an hour. 
And I run to the next meeting. But what AA will offer, what God is giving us in abundance is freedom. And that's my goal, to experience freedom in Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, I'm always puzzled at um, why I waited so long during my first six months in AA and why so many of us wait so long in AA to get busy in our big book, get busy with prayer, get busy developing a life of prayer and meditation, to get busy uh, having a worship with a God of our understanding. A lot of us have contemporary investigation. We get real comfortable in here. You know, there's no waves in my life, so that means everything must be good. Not knowing there's a time bomb of ticking underneath me, and at any moment, boom. And I'm living all over page 52, sometimes very blank, and you can see, and sometimes it's subtle. It's really difficult for me to be still when I got a lot of stuff percolating underneath the surface. Bottles are just a symbol. Alcohol or any other substance are a symbol of a greater problem. I didn't understand that when I was relapsing all the time. I figured if I just didn't drink, I'm great. But what happens when they remove the drink for me in the process of a detox or a treatment center or perhaps drying out in AA? Well, we remove the obvious problem. Joe's not using drugs and Joe's not drinking, but now what? And our book says we ought to get down to causes and conditions. And if I don't, that stuff's going to rise to the surface. Life becomes unmanageable. Uh, life becomes uh, untreated. I become a danger to other people. I start to infect people. I can't live this life without any medication in me. So what do I do? I need relief. I go to a drink because meetings aren't working. So when I complete the first five steps, what I'm left of is the, the, the nuggets out of step five in six and seven. And lot, there's two paragraphs in six and seven. And a lot of folks blow right past them. It's only two paragraphs. How important could they be? I wonder what the 12 steps would look like if we remove six and seven, if we remove those two paragraphs. And what Bill did uh, in his divine inspiration was pretty much split six and seven, like he did four and five, like he did eight and nine, like he did ten and eleven. He split them because he knew people like me were coming in, and I was going to try to find a little loophole somewhere. Oh, he didn't say this. That means I can do it. So he split them. Get ready. Let go. In six and seven. And so I have to acquire a better attitude of willingness when I'm hitting six. Pray for the willingness to let these things go. God better take them, because if you don't deal with my defects, my defects will deal with me. And it's all preparation. It's priming the pump, getting us ready to go out for the first time and take responsibility and show finally some accountability for what we've done, what I've done, all the harms caused to others, and there were a lot. And it shouldn't be a contest of who harmed more. Who did greater things out there? Who harmed more people? That's not the point. The point is I have a list of people I've harmed, and I need to go back to them. I need to be willing in step eight to hit every single person on that list, which came out of my fourth step. I was talking to some guys uh, this morning about this. We look at our fourth column in step four. That's very tangible, where we're selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened. That's very tangible. The first three columns in step four are based on my illusions and delusions about life. Even though Joe did this to me in column two and it hurt, interfered, or threatened me in column three, it's all based on old belief system. Why I'm so angry with you? Because I'm playing God. But column four, rubber hits the road. It's what I've done. Where was selfish? That's tangible. Where was dishonest? That's tangible. Self-seeking and frightened. You can even see that. And that's why I start to harm people. What am I going to do about that? That's my setup, my, my beginning to take a look at harm's cause to others. And now I do some other work in five. I take a look at six and seven. I release all these defects. And the great assignment we would do is release the defects and look at the opposite and thank God for the opposites. And God will do what God's going to do with us in six and seven. It really is just an on my knees surrender. And God, you mold me the way you want because I don't know what's good for me and I don't know what's killing me. The booze is off my back now. Now I got life problems. Now I got me problems. I got defect problems. Interesting thing about defects of character, I will say you have the defect. Oh boy, it's really got you, and I don't like what you're doing. When it comes to me, I make an excuse. You need to suit up and show up. You need to be pristine. But for me, I give myself some wiggle room because I'm me and I'm Moses. I'm different. 
Those things like those kill us. That's why sponsorship is so vital. Not just important, it's vital that we have a sponsor who's on us and calling us on that stuff because I couldn't see myself going sideways. I co-sign my own nonsense. A little dishonest, so it's a little dishonest, so what? A little vengefulness, it's okay. You would do it too. But if our sponsees did that, we'd be all over them. But for me, it's a little bit different. You know, I can drink 65 Red Bulls a day. It's really okay, even though I'm like this all day long. You know? It's okay. And a little weed on the side on the weekends. I mean, I'm not drinking, so what? Make sure my sponsees do it. A little marijuana maintenance won't hurt anyone. After all, it is natural and it's legal now. Right? We do things like this. I know it sounds extreme, but we do things like that. I'm gripped in fear. I can't tell anyone why, because I'm fearful of what you're going to think. More fear. And what I've done, Mark, if I start to worship these defects of character, as ludicrous as that sounds, exactly what we do, because we keep paying homage to them. We, God forbid, we should go to God to have them removed or tell someone this is what's going on with me. We honor them. And we come in with these all false belief systems based on... Uh, uh, I sponsor people and they throw religion at me. This one I love. They were drinking and drugging and sleeping around and lying and cheating and stealing. So let me come and tell you with 30 days. I have a religious beliefs. I can't, I can't go to a meeting on Saturday or Sunday because I'm supposed to be somewhere else. Really? And if I drop a crack rock on the floor, what are you going to do then? Right? It's bizarre some of the stuff we come up with. So it's some of the many, any lengths that I had to go to. And I got challenged, my own belief systems about everything. And little by slowly, as I kind of closed my eyes and held on to my sponsor's hand, and I landed on the other side of the archway, I realized what a liar I was, how delusional I was, claiming belief systems that don't even work anymore. I was just afraid of the unknown. And spiritual growth doesn't happen until I step into what looks like the unknown. And I go from a place of knowing, tangible, this is my life, it's a mess, but I know it, into a place of the unknown. It's very frightening for me and many of us to find out that we can be ripped away of all the defects of character and perhaps even in my brokenness stand somewhat pristine and be one with spirit. You know why it's so frightening? Because suddenly I'm responsible for my behavior now. It's easy to cop to, I'm deaf, dumb, and blind, I'm sick, so I make mistakes, I'll stop the big book next week. One of the things about recovery and getting recovered is there's no more excuses for my behavior or my language or my words or what I'm doing. And one of the things about getting recovered that will scare a lot of people away is now I might have to sponsor someone and be accountable and responsible for this person's life. I'd rather just not you can go to meetings and I'm sick, I'm suffering, and you know, I'm an alcoholic, this is what I do. Nonsense. When I got 30 days, I can cop to that. My big book talks about living joyous, happy, and free. Now I'm very clear, I'm broken on the inside somewhere. I think I said a couple of weeks ago, my sponsor says, Pete, you're on a horse and you're riding backwards, you're never gonna face forward. Face it. That's it. I'm broken. And there's a lot of places in this book that talks about that and another big book that talks about that stuff. We're flawed. I'm flawed. Now, that might not be for you, but I speak for myself. I'm clear I'm flawed in a lot of ways, but it's only with God's hand that he's going to get the clay and put it back together as he sees fit. Six and seven talks about the good and the bad. What I think is good for me might be killing me. What I think is bad isn't so bad. God's just got to tweak it. All the shaping for me to go out in eight, pre preparation for nine. And I have found out all these defects are driven by fear. And if I don't turn to God in 6 and 7 for these defects, how could I possibly go out and make amends, those difficult amends, when defects and fear still got me? I'm going to wait till next week, next month. I'll conveniently forget. It's not that important. They don't remember it anyway. It's all fear and insecurity. My ego has gotten bigger. What will they think of me? They're going to throw me out of their office. I'm afraid to go do this. It's not that important. I'm comfortable. Why upset the apple cart? All this kind of delusional thinking. And at some point, I get drunk. That's what I do. And I need to seek this power to desperation for drowning man, which requires some things of me to do. 
And that's some of the, any lens, go to some of the extremes. But again, if I compare to those extremes that I've been asked to go to or been moved to go to compared to using, it's like kissing a newborn on the cheek. There's, it doesn't even compare. My, my conveniences have been interrupted because of this amends. My conveniences have been interrupted because my sponsor said to pray twice a day or write some inventory. I'm tired at night. If I was using, was there such thing of being tired? I'd snap up out of bed, sick as a dog, or get up off the floor in a hallway and go panhandle. No food in me for two days, no bathing for three or four days, but I had enough for me to go chase the drink. Suddenly I come into AA <clears throat> and I'm tired, I gotta work tomorrow. I got things, I gotta wash my car, then I'll go right into it. It's bizarre what we do. Right? It's all the illness trickling back and then one day, bang. If I'm not constantly turning my life over to God, the illness will take it right back. And he's not gonna come invited either. It's an uninvited guest. Little things we take a look at. How am I dressing up for a meeting when I go speak? How am I dressing up for a meeting, in, period? What are my reasons for being at an AA meeting? Looking for a date or am I looking to get well? Right. How am I doing? How am I treating the place that's pumping blood into me every single day? How am I doing with that? And this power called God, who's giving me another day of breathing and sobriety, Am I paying respects back and saying thank you in the morning and thank you at night? Or I gotta do other things and I'll get to God at some point today. It's one of the 10,000 other things I gotta do during that day. This process of recovery demands a lot. There are requirements. Or I can just go to meetings, hang around and see what happens. And some of the men I was around this weekend, are living with strict spiritual disciplines. That's why they are who they are. That's why they're sober as long as they are. That's why Gary's still sponsoring so many people. That's why Gary looks so vibrant at his age. They all do. Those are my heroes. We could talk to a guy with 50 plus years about inventory, he'll go right to the third and fourth column. I want to be like that. Those are my heroes, spiritual giants, gurus in AA. So I finished this work in six and seven. When I say finish, finish that piece of work because we're going to revisit the steps hopefully at least once a year to experience further depth of self for successful living, to enhance the experience with God because the ego will reemerge, start to show up in different areas. How do I know the ego's reemerging? How much contempt am I feeling during a big book meeting? How much, uh, uncomfortability am I experiencing when someone talks about God in AA meeting? It might be a little different God than me, a little different spin on the big book. And I start getting defensive, uh, full of contempt, a little angry, a little disturbed, a little agitated. That's all my ego flourishing. When I was uh, new to AA, my first uh, handful of years in here, my first sponsor took me to the work one time. He's one of those guys, go to the work one time, and that is it, live in 10, 11, 12, forever. Now, for some folks, that works great. I'm not here to change him. But I found after a few years of doing that, some uncomfortability. I called it flatlining. I was doing all the work I was supposed to do, praying like I was supposed to, sponsoring a ton of guys, but something wasn't right. And Paul Martin talked about this, where the going to the work more than once started. And what he told me was, what they don't share in some of the stories, a lot of our early, mem really early members, after about five years of sobriety, start getting uncomfortable. They went through the work, had an experience sponsoring people. But after about five years or so, he says, him included, were getting uncomfortable, fear was starting to show up, resentment was starting to show up, they're just missing something. And it came when one of his guys were coming over to share a fifth step. He prayed, and he had this thought of, I'll write some inventory and share it with the guy I'm sponsoring. And they swapped inventory. And he took a look at six and seven, saw some amends to be made, made the amends, and got rocketed again. He says, go to the work more than one time. So after a handful of years of being in here, I had a new sponsor who says, we're going to revisit the first nine proposals. And man, oh man, I had so much contempt prior to investigation for people who did that till I got to the other side of the fence and saw it was paradise, how great it was. So hopefully my suggestion would be, not in order, my suggestion would be revisit the work one through nine into 10, 11, and 12. How bad could it, how much could it hurt? Is it inconvenient? Tough. 
It's more inconvenient having to go chase a drink or the, the other stuff at 3 o'clock in the morning or being laid up in a crack house for four days looking out of a people. That's fun. <laughs> They're out there. I know. I hear them. I see them. The shadows. You know, right? Writing a little inventory. An hour, two hours, done for freedom. Right? I know because I did all of this stuff. So step eight talks about my preparation, my willingness. I've done some work in six and seven, and at the end of the seventh step prayer, there's, there's an amen. Note there are no amen after the third step, but there's an amen after seven. Why? Because it's been closed. That body of work of going in and uncovering, discovering, and then discarding is completed for now. And what we need to do is get busy and going out there and fixing, repairing, not just an apology. Some of the amends will be, hey, I'm sorry, and you're about to make amends, that's it, you're done. But the intent is to repair what we've done. Make financial restitution where we've stolen. Take accountability for all my lies and dishonesty. And so step eight for me was preparation and going to every single person that was on my list. Now, the interesting thing, when we look in step four, we have a whole bunch of folks we pull out for our eight-step list. There's more. And the other thing I learned is, even though I have an eight-step list, say, tonight, we'll say, I create an eight-step list and I start tomorrow to make amends, that's not it because in a year or two from now, God might reveal more. I'm just not able to handle all of it just yet. But my job is to chop wood, carry wood, to keep the ground fur, to go out and do what I have to do and be a messenger. And so we have a handful of amends, and my job is to pray to make amends to every single person on that list. Gangsters, drug dealers, whatever it was. I need to be willing to go. Even go to the courts and say, here I am. Our book talks about this. We must be willing to risk our reputation, it tells me. Usually it's the reputation we've created for ourselves. I created my own reputation. It can't be damaged. I might look bad. Hmm? I'd rather have someone say, what a fool, because I went to you to make amends, than see me pass out on my front lawn and say, what a fool. One I'll die from, one I won't. Step nine tells me when to go and when not to go. So my job is to get ready, to get the engine running, the pump prime to go out and hit everyone on that list. And that's my prayer of willingness to go to any lens. It's interesting, after the third step prayer, there's uh, any lens. I mean, in, the, in how it works, there's an any lens. And in steps eight and nine, they throw any lens at us twice. Because what happens to a guy like me who's an alcoholic, I will make 10, 15, 20 amends out of maybe 50. And I'm starting to feel real good. The car is running. Everything's smooth. Everything's firing. I'm going back and sharing about all these amends. And I'm feeling quite good about making these amends. And the mind says, now you can rest a little bit. I know you got 30 or 40, but just hang out. Besides, those people from 20 years ago, and you don't really need to go there. Leave the past in the past, and it starts to talk. And our book says, hey, hold on. Any lengths, don't forget, to find a spiritual experience. Any lengths for victory over alcohol, it tells us. So I keep moving. And it's about praying for willingness to go see these folks. Step nine says not to go if I'm going to cause more harm to others. I'm not others. We get to, I get to walk with the armor of God into any, any, any cesspool, into any sordid spot to make amends. Even when it looks a little tricky. A bunch of years ago, <clears throat> I had an amends. I was going through the work for, I don't know, it was the third or fourth time. And, uh, this young lady came up on my, my harms list. I said, oh, my God, completely forgot about this one. So i got to make amends, but I don't know how to get in touch with this person. I have no idea. It's been a million years since I saw this person. And through a series of circumstances, I get her phone number. I pray, oh, my God, it's been so I make a phone call, and she knew immediately who I was as soon as I said hello. And I says, I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and um, I need to make amends to you for some past behavior. And I started to make this amends, and we were talking, and um, she wanted to see me eyeball to eyeball, so I need to go. And I said to her, what can I do to make it right? And she said, I need money. It's okay. And so I go to meet this woman, and uh, it was in Brooklyn, in a, in a rough area she was living. 
And I pulled up to the house. To the, it was a projects where she was living, actually. Uh, I pulled up to the projects in somewhere in Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn. And I make a prayer. It's okay, God, just give me the words to say and how to make this right, because this was delicate. Because I wasn't a gentleman when I was drinking. I was an animal. And this woman suffered from my, my stuff. And I got out, and she was standing there with a pit bull. I said, oh, boy, I really damaged her. <laughs> and um, I started to make the approach again. And I gave her her money, and I knew by looking at her, she was where I left off in 1988. She was really sick. And it was obviously drugs that was just, just ripping this woman apart. This was a woman who was pristine at one time, and she was frail and sick looking, and it was sad, and it broke my heart. And I delicately offered her uh, some ways out, some 12-step fellowships, including AA, and some treatment ideas, and she would have none of it. She took her money, and I got back into my car. I made a prayer for her, I made a prayer of thank you, and I start to pull out, and I drove away, and I got up to the red light, and I noticed the cops, if you know anything about the projects, the cops drive through the projects, the undercovers and things like that. Right? The back guys in the back row know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, and here comes a cop behind me. I didn't think much about it until I made a left turn, and they followed me, and their lights went on. I said, oh, what I do now? And they followed me, and they, they hit the horn. I pulled over, and they saw me talking to this woman. I'm making an amends and give her money. <laughs> so they're thinking I'm dirty. So I got John Wayne, one of the cops, and uh, this other cop was about three foot tall with a Napoleon complex. <laughs> uh, he was the one I had to worry about. And... Uh, License and registration. Now, prior to this amends, uh, I was living in Staten Island, and prior to this amends, I, I went to speak at a meeting in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. Now I'm in Sheepshead Bay. So the logistics are crazy. So he looks at my driver's license and says, what are you doing here? I said, well, I was just in Sunset Park. I'm a member of AA to give a talk. He's, hold on. He's, you live in Staten Island, Sunset Park, Sheepshead Bay. He's, get out of the car. <laughs> and so I get out of the car. I remember my, my coin. I used to wear a coin around my neck for my sobriety time. And I'm trying to show him the coin. I tell him I'm a member of AA. I'm here to make amends. I'm here to do what's right and fix the past. He didn't want to have anything. He puts me against the car, and he starts rolling me and the car looking for stuff. I said, okay, God, you know why I'm here. Here's in any lens. My sponsor knew. I was married at the time. My, my wife at the time knew exactly what I was doing. Everything was on board, except the cops didn't know this. And I'm telling them that there's a meeting called the Sheep's at Bay Group right by there, and a Marine Park Group just a few blocks from there. And I had a lot of guys on the job go to these meetings. I said, I sponsored some of you guys on the job. They didn't want to hear anything. This one cop who was about 6 foot 12 pulls me over. 6 foot 12, that's a joke. <laughs> you better start serving coffee here. He says to me, is this that immense thing you guys do? I says, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. He says, keep your mouth shut. Let my sergeant do what he's got to do. In the meantime, the paddy wagon turns the corner. And they're on that thing, and they're talking back and forth, and there's a crowd. It looked like that show Bad Boys when they arrest people. And there's a crowd on Emmons, not Emmons, one of these avenues. Oh, my God. And the first thing I'm thinking of, if they pop me for no reason, I'm going to go home tonight, but the call is going to be made to someone. My old man's going to get this phone call, and he's going to say, here we go again. Foreign amends. Talk about any lens. I didn't have nice things in my head about my sponsor who encouraged me to go do this amends. Anyway, they cut me loose. Obviously, so get out of here. And I got back in my car, and I drove home. It's a funny story, but it's also an any lens story how we will get some heat. The plan was to go fix the past and make this right, even offer this young lady some help. The police had some other ideas. And I went through that uncomfortability, so what? The thing is, I was standing there. I was obviously clean and sober. They could have taken my car apart. They weren't going to find anything. They could have strip searched me. They weren't going to find anything. I was clean and sober, and I was there for the right reason. He knew, my sponsor knew, and my wife at the time knew. I was clean, figuratively and literally. Mm -hmm. And so I went home, and that was done. 
What I found after that was our book talks about how the difficult amends seem to be the most beneficial. My spiritual condition got shot up with steroids after that night. I felt I can walk with God through fire and go out unharmed, which is exactly what can happen to us. What if I would have said, I'm not going there. I'm not going to the projects in Sheep's at Bay. I don't want to call this woman. It's a long time ago. I don't know if I'd be here. Maybe I would. I don't know if I'd be spiritually fit. Maybe I would. I'm not willing to toss the dice anymore with my life. So I get to suit up and show up. I get to, I get to, I get to, and go with God. I clear it with God, clear it with a sponsor, clear it with the people around me, which is what Step 9 talks about. And they all gave me the green light, and off I went. Because in Step 9, it tells us, if I'm going to go make amends and it might harm some family, put them in jeopardy, I need to clear it with them first. Like before I go to the judge and surrender myself, maybe I got a little wifey poo at home that if they do take me, she has no income coming into the house. How is she going to support the house? I got to say, is this okay with you? If it's a mad, bad marriage, you say, yeah, go. <laughs> right? Most of them will say, what are we going to do if you do go in? And so I need to take that into consideration. I also have no right to put someone else at risk. If, if me and a couple of guys are doing some illegal things and I get sober, see the light, and I want to go fix it, but it might implicate them, I need to go to those guys and get their permission. If they say no, it's a no. But there's ways of putting back, I have found, into the universe what I took out. There were a lot of amends uh, that I, I couldn't make because it would cause more harm. I, I was a longshoreman for a lot of years. And there's some rough characters around that industry. When those folks look for you, they're not looking for you with Dunkin' Donuts and a cup of coffee. You're in trouble. <laughs> rough characters. And some of the illegal things I did, I knew if I just went in there and said, hey, listen, this is what I did, that there were going to be some serious implications, not for me only, but for a lot of other people who had families, who had jobs. They would be fired and maybe worse. At a sit in council, one of the things I've learned with step nine, to sit in council with the sponsor. Any great spiritual teacher always has a, a teacher. Sit in council, what do I do about this before I just go? And I was told you can't because a half a dozen other men are going to be in serious trouble. So what do I do about this time that I stole? What about this money I stole? What about these things that I stole? The things I felt suddenly fell off a truck one day. Is I took a, a lump sum of money, sat with in meditation, and if it was $100 or $1,000, I took that money and start putting it back into the universe in the form of charities, very anonymously. And as far as work, with respect to work, I would show up early and leave late like we do in AA. I was a guy who get paid on Wednesday and disappeared on Monday. And the old time was on a job at 5, 10 after 5. I said, kid, go home. Is it okay to go home now? I knew it was time to go home, but I gave them the respect because I didn't in the past. I would do things like that. I wasn't just a lump on a log org. And what happened, I became a really good worker. Reliable, dependable, accountable, responsible. And I wouldn't take a penny to do anything illegal. I didn't steal anything. The interesting thing about amends is we go from here to here. We go from knowing to unknowing. We go from making amends for one reason and other areas of our life clear up. So I was going back to these amends. My first time through the work, I made over 200 direct approaches. I was doing like drive-by amends. And uh, a lot of these were longshoremen and truck drivers. Paying back the money, paying back the money, making the best deal possible if it was a lot of money. Not fearing bill collectors, telling them my condition. I follow the book. Hey, listen, I've been drinking and doing some bad things for a long time. Can I make a deal with you? It wasn't a deal that I liked, it was a deal that they liked, and little by slow, I got out of a lot of debt. But I was making uh, amends to these truck drivers and longshoremen, and um, my reputation was changing because my character had changed. And 
Making financial amends, sometimes personal relationships improve. Making personal relationship amends and sometimes career changes, all for the better. We, we go to a place that we can't figure out with the mind. And what these men were doing, they would knock on a door where I was working or see me out in the field, and they would say, do you still go for the cure? That's what they were called. You go to that double A place, you know. I mean, they were in the blind about Alcoholics Anonymous. And it sounded like this. I have a niece, I have a nephew, I have a son, I have a daughter who's suffering. Can you take them to the place you go to? And I took a lot of their sons and nephews to AA meetings in Brooklyn. And as, with respect to the woman, I would call a couple of the ladies in AA and say, listen, I got a prospect. You want to go get her? I don't know if any of those people are sober today, but that was my amends back. So here I was making financial amends and able to be of service and practice these principles there. One of the byproducts of amends is because our character changes, our reputation changes, and sometimes we're not even aware of it, but we start to uh, help people heal with this. We become credible. It's vital for me to experience the sunlight of the Spirit making amends. It's vital. And if I have outstanding amends that I could be making tonight without causing more harm, then why am I at this meeting? I should be out there making that amends. Have I had a, am I claiming to have a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps? As the result of these steps? Or as a result of steps nine and a half, nine and a quarter? I got a hundred amends to make. I made 25, but I'm good. I haven't had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. I had a spiritual awakening as a result of some of the steps. I'm not completed with nine. Some amends, we can't go to those people directly, we make them indirectly. Give money to charities. Leave the women alone, guys. Direct them to the ladies. We're not a hawk anymore. We're gentlemen, spiritual uh, warriors, sober gentlemen. We practice these principles in all our affairs, and the only way I'm able to do that is by accessing this power called God, who's going to do it for me, because on my own power, I can't do that. Defects start to run the show again. I make a lot of excuses. Step nine is incredible what goes on, but we don't know until we experience it. If we really want to experience God, make amends, clean them up, talk about amends. One of the things I was encouraged by my sponsor, talk about amends. Talk about, because what will happen is, oh yeah, I just, there's an amends I have to make. There's an amends I have to make. One of the byproducts. I brought my family and my dad incredible amount of shame and embarrassment. My dad was a shop steward at the place I worked. I was known as Vic's kid. Vic's son, supposed to walk in his footsteps. Now, my dad wasn't on the wrong side of the law. He wasn't on the right side of the law. He was a street guy. But his reputation preceded him. It was impeccable. Head up, shoulder squared, no matter what was coming down the pike. And then I showed up. And they were like, what happened? You sure he's your son? <laughs> And my dad and my family was experiencing the hideous four horsemen because of me. Not I'm so powerful, but alcoholism levels everything in its path. But my alcoholic mind would say, well, it's not that bad, or who cares, or don't even think about people like that. We don't think about our dishonesty, how much it infects other people, how it has consequences, the domino effect, because it's all about me all the time. But one of the things about living this life, being moved to live this life, given the power to live this life, being guided to live this life, and into amends, when I was making amends uh, at my place of work, and God kept me there for about two years, I finished all the amends I was consciously aware of at the time, and a few months later, I found myself in the industry I work now. God says, you need to go back there to finish this work. When that work's complete, I'm moving you out. There's no more work for you to do here. I'm making amends, and uh, what came to me was uh, a couple of guys sat me down, and they would tell me things like this. Do you know how proud your old man is of you? My dad wouldn't say anything. I knew he let me in his office in the morning. He was a lot looser around me. I'd buy lunch instead of getting money for him to buy lunch, you know. He'd say, do me a favor, take my car up to the car wash. I'd go to the car wash and bring it right back, not disappear for six months. <laughs> with no fenders and hubcaps on it, right? right? <laughs> One time my dad, I think it was a test, he gave me a big wad of money. He says, do me a favor, hold on to this, I'm going to ask for it back. I said, what's, what's this? <laughs> so I put, it, I actually had a savings in a checking account. I deposited it. Well, about three, four months went by, he says, 
code. Remember that thing I gave you? I couldn't say money. Remember that thing I said? Yeah. He said, I need it. I said, okay. I came back in 20 minutes. He just looked at me like, this is really going on. <laughs> but these men would tell me that your old man is so proud of you. All he does is talk about you. And what they referred to is he beat it. That's how they called us. They didn't say he was recovered or in AA. He beat it. He beat this thing. And my old man's going to worry about me until God calls him home or me home first, whichever happens. That's what parents do. But he's worrying as a parent would worry for their children, not like he used to worry when the ambulance was driving by the house and it wasn't for me, is it him and that? Or the cops and things like that. Because of this, we get to heal other people. And we get to affect people that way. Those men that I worked with back then, they wanted, and I mean this, I'm not glorifying this or... or, or, or making it bigger than what it was. They wanted no part of me. In fact, the only reason why they would talk to me was out of respect to my dad. They wanted no part of me. I was a nuisance. I never showed up for work. I looked the part of a bum. They knew what I was doing. I was borrowing when I was bad seed. Well, I'm walking this walk, and I'm making amends, and payday would come, and I still have money from last payday on me. Then I started dating someone for a while, and I, they, they, they saw me get married and drive to work in a new car one time, and then buy a house. Only because I was practicing these principles in all my affairs, I was a responsible adult. Well, these same men who despise me, and I can't blame them, July 14th my belly button birthday, and I walked into work on July 14th one day, and they were all huddled on the other side of the yard, and they called me, hey, kid, come on over, come on over. And I walked into this, uh, it looks like a toll booth that they worked out of on the yard or a little desk and things like that. And I walk in, and they have this little donut cake and with a little candle in there, and about seven long showmen start singing happy birthday. This was messy, right? <laughs> but they start singing happy birthday to me, right? And when that was done, they gave me a kiss on the cheek, a hug, we're proud of you, way to go. And, and I said, oh, my God, how did this happen? These guys wanted no part of me, and they acknowledged my birthday. That doesn't go on in that environment. You don't show emotion. You don't shed a tear. Everyone's John Wayne, and that's what they did. And I realized these little gifts that God gives us about practicing these principles <clears throat> in all my affairs. I didn't make amends for a birthday cake or some pats on the back. Is what I had to do and what I got to do. Practicing these principles in all our affairs and making amends. Um, Fast forward, uh, one amends took me uh, 17 years to make. I talk about two stories often when it comes to amends. 17 years and one I made just a couple of years ago. But about, I don't know, 24 years sobriety, whatever it was. 23 years sobriety. 17 years into recovery, does this person show up? Now, I had tried many attempts, writing letters, making phone calls, couldn't get in touch with this person. This place of work would tell me he's not here, he doesn't work here anymore, just a lot of things, unanswered letters. And um, I'm working in the treatment center business. I was do out on a marketing trip, and I drove from uh, um, way out to Long Island from where I live. <coughs> New Jersey out to Amityville, Long Island. That's a long drive. And I planned the trip, and I planned to leave really early for traffic to get there for my scheduled appointment. And as luck would have it, I got there like two hours early. And my mind says, well, let's go to the diner, have a cup of tea, and hang out, and we'll go in. And the Spirit says, no, go in now. And I wrestled with it. But when God moves you, God moves. I parked the truck, grabbed my duffel bag, and I walk in. As I'm walking into the, the, the reception office, who's walking out is this guy. We'll call him Joe, who I was supposed to make amends to. I've been searching for for 17 years. And he remembered me. And I said, I need to talk to you. That's okay. And he gave me some time. And I made my approach, which is the approach, and I made the amends. There's a difference between making an approach and the amends when it's completed. And it was just about my behavior, because what I did to this man was, he's, he was the physical fitness guy there. And they would take us from the unit across the yard about maybe 50 yards into this uh, gymnasium. They had a little fitness center, basketball court, and such. And while they were walking us, I beelined out to Sunrise Highway and took off. And he made chase. And he's responsible for his patients. And what I found out when I came back, I was actually dragged back to treatment, 
that he almost lost his job over this. He was reprimanded for it. He was put on notice and all this other stuff. I didn't care. What do I care about this guy and his job? Until I got sober and I realized, oh, my God, it almost cost a man his career because of my shenanigans. So I had to go back and make it right, and I was glad he was still there. And we spoke a bit, and he was thrilled that I was in the business I'm in and uh, complimented me on the life I'm living. And he went back to work, and I went in there and, and waited for my appointment, and the whole day changed. So I didn't care if I didn't see anybody. The whole day changed. My life was wearing a world like a loose garment, in the world, not of it. Everything changed. Everything was light. Everything was free. Another piece closed, chapter closed. Just a couple of years ago, I, I, my first love, I'm going to get married, you know, the first love thing. Alcohol became more important than her and her family, and fidelity went by the board as quick. And I broke her heart, not because I'm some special guy, but I broke her heart. And she saw this, this young guy just blow up in front of her, and we lost touch. Through a series of circumstances, I get in touch with her, and the first thing she said to me is, Oh my God, I thought you were dead. What happened to you? We talk about you often. My family, my mom and dad, whatever happened to Peter, he's probably dead. He got really sick. And I was able to make an approach with her and then make an amends to her. And I says, what can I do to make it right? And she, I talked to her about AIDS, no clue about AIDS, don't even know what alcoholism is. I was able to tell her about the great things we do here. I said, what can I do to make it right? And she says, based on what you said, I've suspected this for a while. I think I married an alcoholic. And she told me about her husband. She says, if I talk to him, would you take him to the place you go to? And I told her, absolutely I would. She called me a couple of days later and says he would have none of it. He was insulted. They got into a big fight. She says, if everybody comes willing, can I call you? I said, absolutely. So can he. But that amends was completed. And that part of my life is closed. There's no loose ends. If I ever see somebody walk in the door, I don't have to go, oh, my God, i got to get out of here. I owe them money. Just one quick story, and I'll close. We need to seek counsel. I needed to seek counsel. I was just out of the starting gate. I'm approaching step four. I'm in uh, 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 this workout place, and I see the cop who arrested me for the first time, my first pinch. What does my ego say? Let's go make amends for being such a bad seed. I go up to this guy who's working out. He's obviously off duty. And he's, hi, remember me? And he went up one side and down the other. I was shaking. I was so embarrassed. And I called my sponsor. I'll clean up the language. But he went up one side and down the other on me. So how dare you do that? You're not even in step four. You didn't see counsel. What you wanted was a pat on the back. So I never did that again. Because in a process of amends, we get to stand free with no skeletons in the closet. Life's an open book. And really, there's nothing between me and God anymore. There could be. But right now, there isn't. As long as I chop wood and carry water. I'm out of time. That's all I got. Thank you. My name is Peter, recovered alcoholic. I'm grateful to be alive and sober. Part of a sacred place called Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, <clears throat> we're in the far turn, we've got just a few weeks to go doing this, and uh, we get to talk about uh, 10, 11, and 12 in the next few weeks. <clears throat> My experience with that uh, discipline, um, strict disciplines, for many of us who do 10, 11, and 12, not talk about 10, 11, and 12, but actually do it and experientially can talk about it. Um, one of the things I've found uh, with 10 and 11, it's one of the, the first steps that drop off the map for many of us when we're on this path, we'll claim to be on this path. So um, we'll kick it around and see where God takes us. Uh, God separated me from alcohol on June 23rd, 1988. And um, that power separated me and kept me separated till tonight. And as long as I suit up and show up to the altar and, and do all the things that I'm expected to do, um, <clears throat> so much is given, much is expected, um, I continue to stay sober. One of the neat things <clears throat> I've gotten to experience um, coming into Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, experiencing grace, which keeps me sober. And if I look back on my life while I was out there, a lot of the near misses 
of dead and alive. It was grace that kept me sober. Uh, being in the streets and a lot of bad things happening to me, getting involved in a lot of illegal things, it was grace that kept me from going to prison. It was grace that kept me from having a bullet in me. It was grace that kept me you know, out of trouble, out of scrapes. And I come into our folks Anonymous, and based on my track record, I should have been drunk many times in Alcoholics Anonymous in the early days. Uh, but somehow I, remained to, I was able to remain away from a drink. I get into this big book with the sponsor who I'm accountable to, and a group of folks I've been accountable to since I got here, and that group of folks has changed and evolved. Uh, but I get to experience the power, which gives me grace. And I have found a huge difference in getting grace which is kind of like this gift from God just to be one of his children, which we would do if any of us have children. Even though we're angry with them, we want to punish them and do all the things that we, we do to bring them up right, they're still our children, and we'll go hungry and give them our food and go cold and give them our clothes because they're ours. That's just grace. That's what God has done for me in, in the near misses and keeping me sober. Uh, but somehow I'm able to experience that power which breathes life into me and keeps me in a position of neutrality, safe and protected and unharmed. And the least I can do is suit up and show up to the altar, my altar, and give him thanks. And continue to ask him to uh, let me carry the vision of his will into all my activities, not my will into the activities that are convenient for me. And what I found is this path, uh, this spiritual path, um, is not as easy as many of us might think, or I thought it was on the outside. The spiritual path is a very narrow road. And the things I could have gotten away with in my first six months, and I did, I can no longer get away with now. That doesn't mean the mind is not going to pull me in the direction it wants to pull me, and ego wants to separate me from that power. Ego wants to separate me from you. Ego wants to separate, separate me from the big book, etc. So the mind's always working. But discipline to the spiritual life, being disciplined to the spiritual life, only comes from God, and it starts with my willingness to do anything, the gift of desperation, huh? But it can be a really lonely walk at times on a spiritual path. And only if you're on that kind of walk do you know what I'm talking about. It goes beyond the camaraderie of the fellowship, the sacred fellowship, and the handshakes and the hugs, which all are band on an open moon. We get in, we need that. We still, I still look forward to that, being around all kind of folks. But there's something else that goes on, and um, the road gets really narrow, and the door we're going to walk through is even more narrow. And that separates, in a sense, me from many others, or others from other folks in the masses. And sometimes you will be revered or reviled. I have been because of this book and the walk we walk. Sometimes in the same meeting and sometimes by the same person. The first half of the meeting, they like you. second half of the meeting, they hate you. Especially when we speak truth or you touch a nerve in someone or you wake someone up to the fact that maybe they could be doing more and they're not. But that's just the price to pay for the glory of God in Alcoholics Anonymous. And when we study any kind of history of spiritual people, we will see how they were put to the test many times and even doubted their faith, doubted their existence, doubted the walk. But somehow we continue to chop wood and carry wood and find ourselves just doing what we do. And the great thing about being on a spiritual walk is that you can't do anything else but that. You can't see yourself doing anything else but that. The walk I walk is my walk. I'm a spoke in a very big wheel here in our folks. Now. It's no better, no worse. No more spiritual, less spiritual than anyone else. But uh, I couldn't fathom living any other life. I couldn't imagine going through recovery without having a sponsor that I speak to regularly, consistently, and accountable to, and responsible to weekly. At least weekly. <clears throat> Wednesday nights at 8 o'clock, I lock myself in my bedroom with my big book and a notepad and a pen, and I go to my sponsor, my teacher. And whatever he's got, I do. And many things he tells me to do, I'm not always too thrilled about. Sometimes amends, sometimes assignments, sometimes reworking his stuff, sometimes taking a look at stuff that I don't really want to look at. I couldn't imagine life without having that. It isn't dependence upon another human being, but it is a connection and a needed one to keep me accountable. I have found most folks who uh, uh, weren't accountable, me in my first six months, usually we go sideways. I went sideways, and we get sick quick. And the ego is so in charge, they never tell me that people are going sideways. So I need someone who can see what I can. That's sponsorship. So how could I walk 10 and 11 without being accountable to someone? How could I walk 10 and 11 without really having a prayer life? 
in a life of meditation. And the neat thing is, I don't need to tell anyone about it other than when I'm invited to go talk and speak truth. I don't need to run around and say, you know how much I pray? You know, let me tell you how humble I am. Give me about an hour. You know, I'm such a super neat guy. Let me tell you. I don't need to do any of that stuff. And anyone on a spiritual path doesn't need to do that unless you ask. Or you're invited to a podium to go share what it was like, what happened, what it's like now, what we're trying to be like now. Go forwards through the steps, admit, accept, and surrender in step one. Take a real good look at a problem. And for me, my step one was really done out there. One of my teachers called it step zero. You know, the research we do, we come back in here with a lot of arrows in our butt and say, okay, what do I do now? And sometimes it takes a lot of bottoming out. And then we come in here and we get an education, and more important than that, the transformation happens as to what's wrong with me and what I need to do. And only through desperation do I say, okay, give me more. Lock into that, okay, what's next? What's next? Even though I don't know where I'm going, still don't. Still don't know where I'm going. My life is still none of my business. And I take a look at step one about the phenomenon called craving, the, the mental obsession, and this thing called the spiritual malady, which I really didn't know was when I got here. I thought it was religion. And at some point, religion and spirituality just might meet, depending on how our journey looks and what we're searching for. But at the beginning, I had to get clear. There's two different walks. And for me, I had a lot of problems with religion, but I couldn't have an argument with spirituality because they says all you need to do is believe in something other than you, something greater than you, this power of all love and no opposite, and, uh, and bringing that into all your affairs. What an honor, I can't go through it, but it had to be better than what I was doing, even sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. It had to be better because you can sober me up, but I can still be a horse thief. I'm just a sober horse thief. I can be more dangerous sober. I was very predictable when I was drunk. I usually pass out and do stupid things, embarrass you, embarrass myself, and then get arrested. Okay. Step two is my point that this power that was greater than me was going to restore me to wholeness of mind, to truth, to sanity, where the drink problem, the thought about drinking was going to be removed. And I want to get there. Of course, it has to be better than what I'm doing. A group of drunks would go the only direction. I found safety and power in these numbers. And I felt some sort of uh, uh, consoling when I would walk into them, some sort of band-aid on an open wound, being around our kind. You know, the hugs and the handshakes and the camaraderie, that was something good. Because out there, as we know, it's not like that. You pay to get stuff, and that's it. You don't have a friendly drug dealer. You might think he's your friend. Yeah. Until you come up short one day. Then he don't know you. And then you beg, borrow, steal, get on your knees, plead, beg, and do a lot of funky things to get that stuff. And the bartender might give you a buyback once in a while. But if you have no money, the bouncers throw you out. And the liquor store give you credit once in a while. But you got to pay each other, otherwise you don't get served. So it goes on and on and on. I come in here, and they're like, just glad to see me because you're one of us. I've said this a million times. This is the only place on the planet that I know that I can tell you guys about the most god-awful things I've done in my life, and you say, give me a number, I'll give you a call. Yeah. Now, you tell a civilian that you go to a PTA meeting and say, here's what I did, you're not invited back. They call the cops. Right? You go up to your neighbor and say, you know how many times I beg, barred, and stole, and ripped people off? I even held guns to people. Can I come over for Thanksgiving dinner? <laughs> we say, yeah, come on over, bring your friends too, right? <clears throat> well, me too, <laughs> step three was a decision a lot of times in some of our AA meetings bless their hearts step three they tell you just hang around step three work step three get a good third step read the 12 and 12 for the next six months usually we die so we gather up information about this step three we talk about step three till the cows come home about what it is my rule God's will turning it over letting go all this stuff we don't have a clue what that means and if we want to find out what that means what we do is make a decision in three by way of third step prayer with the sponsor and launch into a course of vigorous action step four that's how we do step three by doing four through nine that's it because as an alcoholic, when I say I turn my will and life over to care of God, great. Now what? In 20 minutes, I'm acting out again. I'm in fear again. I'm taking over. I'm controlling. I'm vengeful. All these things. The defects are still, still breathing. Step three is simply a decision. So about three, four months ago, I, Mary and I decided to go on this diet because I was sick and tired of having this stuff. And I didn't like the idea. I'm not a gym guy. I don't like going to the gym and working out and walking around like I've been working out for eight years. You know those guys in the gym? Right? You get the bottled water guys. They work out one time. They got a bottle of water. 
25 headbands plugged into God knows what. I, I can't do that. So we made a decision to go on a diet, a really healthy diet. And what we did was we took some action, which meant I couldn't eat ice cream at night. And I couldn't have cake. And I couldn't have pasta. And then we talked about it. We get to not eat that. We get to not do that because we get to live healthy. So it was in the action. A week went by, a month went by, two months went by, three months went by. And suddenly things started to change. Feel healthier, etc. By taking action. You go to the gym on day one. Six months later, you look like you've been taking care of your body. People say, what's going on? You look great. You look different. You look healthy. Okay. Step three was simply a decision to go to this power. Yeah, I'm going to turn everything over to this power, but I haven't done a thing yet. I need to take some action, which means a sponsor is going to give me some instructions out of my book on how to begin to take to make a difference in my consciousness, in my spirit, to wake it up. And that's by the removal of everything I think I am. Everything I think God is, isn't. Everything I think I am, isn't. And I find out what God is by finding out what God is not, who I be, by finding out what I am not. It goes on and on and on. The process of recovery is always removal, subtraction, never addition. I don't, we don't need a thing. Now the mind says, oh, I need things. I need a cell phone. That's the first thing I need in order to recover. I work in a treatment center because I never saw attachments to a cell phone in my life. Lie, cheat, and steal to get possession of a cell phone so I can be spiritual. Got to go on Facebook first. Day. Before I pray, let me hit Facebook to make sure I am liked today. Right? And we do all these things. So I stop moving through four, and then I discuss in five. And then I take a look at what's left of the rubble in 6 and 7, the defects of character that are still breathing. And as long as they're around, I'm not going to truly experience this power called God. The interesting thing in the, 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 the flying the ointment here is I can't work on defects of character. We think we can. I'm working on my defects. How's that going for you? We can, what, how can I possibly work on a defect? In chapter 2, Agnostics, it tells me lack of power is my dilemma. So what power do I have to work on a defect? That's more powerful than me. In fact, I will protect the defects. I will own them. And the thought of losing certain defects is frightening. So I'll just mask it for a while and raise my hands. I'm working on my defects and try self-will to overcome self-will. It usually fails, sure. And then I'm back again. And then I'm kind of like cheating with ice cream and pasta and wondering, how come I'm gaining weight again? Because I'm not committed to this. And it's a commitment. It's responsibility. But God can, and God could have would if he was sought. doesn't mean defects are going to go away in my time, in my way. In fact, some of those defects are simply assets taken to the extreme, becoming liabilities. And God has to remove some and tweak some. None of my business. But I need to go to God. I can't work on defects. Some of my meetings, we talk about six and seven. I'm working on this defect. No, you're not. You're doing nothing. You can't, we don't have the power to pull it off. But seeking the power... He'll do or she'll do what it will do what it has to do. And that's none of my affair. My job is to suit up and show up to the altar, to this book, and surrender in that brokenness to God. Because that's a real, real clear-cut, very tangible piece of information, 6 and 7. 6 and 7 says, Peter Marinelli, you are broken. You are not perfect. You have defects. You have cracks in the armor. And the only one who can seal those up is God. And so that's what I do. I don't know if I fully grasped all of that the first time through the work, but after a while you do, and you realize how damaging they are. And so we take a look at eight, and we go out and make amends, and things have changed dramatically by the time we're into amends. They ought to be. And by the time we're cleaning up all the amends, we're consciously aware of, I know for me, it was like the doors blew open on my life. I looked at everything different, felt things different. Who I was was completely different. And people were noticing it way before I did. I remember waking up one day and realizing, oh my God, things have changed me. I had another last time I thought about drinking. I'm taking care of myself. I'm showing up for work. I'm self supporting for my own contributions. And I'm in love with God again. How did this happen? And I like the effect produced by recovery. And then as we're, we're cleaning up nine, we slide into 10 and 11. And some of us start off like gangbusters and we're in that. And then the ego starts to reemerge. Because things are going so well. Bill says the goose hung high. Things were going so good for a while. I even have a couple of little sponsees I'm working with, and I'm a little bit of a big deal in my home group. 
and I start to read my own headlines. People say I'm doing good, and I depend on that. You say I'm doing good, I depend on that. And my talks depend on, oh, if I sound good, so they like me, because now I like the effect produced by that. I start to worship my emotions and my feelings rather than God. I need stuff to make me feel good. And what I've done, I just cut God out, the one power that's been feeding me. And the ego starts to flex its muscles a little bit and starts to stretch. And little by slowly has its arms around me in a bear hug. And I ease God out. And now I don't really need to meditate. I'm busy. And nightly review, I worked all day. I'll do it tomorrow. Oh, I don't even know what nightly review is. And my sponsor, I call him when I'm in the jam. And step 10, my walking around stuff, I'm doing a lot of damage. And I'm making amends when it's convenient for me to make amends instead of promptly. And I'm worried about this reputation I have because I don't want to lose the reputation I've created for AA or my, or my home group or my job or my relationship. And I haven't completed all my amends. I have some amends that are outstanding. Defects of character start to flex their muscles again. I'm not accountable to anyone. I didn't even have a sponsor. And as far as turning it over, I'm running the show. I am now God. Although I claim God to you. I say, oh, I believe in God. But I'm God. I'm making all my decisions. I'm seeking counsel on nothing. I have some insane thoughts coming back. And now I start to sneak around on the relationship. And now I start to uh, do things to my, with my company that mm, if I get caught, I'm going to get in some trouble. And it goes on and on and on. My life is a complete mess. I come to a meeting. I put on my AA game face. My life is completely unmanageable. I'm getting some weird thoughts going on. I'm acting out a little bit. I'm getting thirsty. And then bang, I get drunk. And I just went backwards through the steps. And I'm not immune to that. No one's immune to that, regardless of how long we're sober. Because as soon as I cut God out, I'm on my own. I'm on a raft in the middle of the ocean. Good luck. And tomorrow's not going to get better. Tomorrow's going to get worse until I need a drink. And then I use my mind, my broken mind, to figure this all out. I'll figure it out. Anytime I say, I'm going to figure it out, I think I know what I need to do, that is dishonesty in neon lights. I don't know what to do. I cannot figure it out. If I could have figured it out, 1988, when it came to AA, I just put the plug in the jug, figure it out my life, and get on with it. But I can't. I came here because I can't figure this out. I can't figure out somebody. I can't figure out God. I can't figure out anything. So I come to AA in desperation, tell me what to do, you tell me what to do, six months goes by, I know what I need to do. Just think of the arrogance, I did it, until we bottom out. And bottoming out can be a great thing for many of us. There's some guys I've sponsored over here, I pray for them to bottom out. And people who are drinking, I pray that they bottom out. I stop praying for sobriety for them. I'm not God. I pray that they bottom out because when we bottom out, we become teachable. December 22nd, 1988, I completely bottomed out in AA. I was off the chain, as we would say. I was driven by a hundred forms of fear. I was selfish, self-seeking, self-serving. I was acting out. I couldn't sleep at night. I wasn't eating. I was a train wreck and going to AA meetings. And I got really thirsty on December 22nd, 1988. But that wasn't the plan. It just showed up. The alcohol piece of us, the alcoholism would just show up. And we're thirsty, really thirsty. And usually when suddenly shows up, we have, I have no shot. When that thing comes knocking, it pulls me by the throat. Off I go. And if I'm lucky, I get back. So the way we go forward through steps, I can go backwards through the steps. And my God has made that abundantly clear to me at a deep level. What I'm very grateful for is I don't have to go, I don't waver on that. This is how God has made me. He's disciplined me to the spiritual life. So the drinking thoughts and the acting out thoughts and that kind of behavior has been removed. And that's a day at a time process contingent on my spiritual condition. A book uses the word maintenance, and that word has gotten like destroyed in some of our meetings. Maintenance doesn't mean to just keep as is. A flowing river is a healthy one, one that just gets stagnant. You can't drink the water. It gets ugly. We need to be flowing, growing, or we're going, as the old timers would say. So I come to step 10, and it talks about growing on this thing. In step 10 has a page and a half of incredible spiritual information. A page and a half is all it is. And there isn't much to do in step 10. I get to do step 10, which is my walking around. What I'm doing after my prayer meditation in the morning, which is really piece of 11, now I'm off. I'm in the car and I'm going to work and I'm at work. I'm coming to a meeting. I'm going shopping. I'm taking care of my children. Whatever it is in my day, whatever my chores are. And very often the mind says, in order to be spiritual, I have to own all day long. 
And I have to look for signs. I have to have these things happen to me. And I could be just waiting for Godot. I could be waiting forever. And sometimes the most spiritual thing can happen is my children are hungry, I feed them. My children need a hug, so I hug them. Whoever I'm in a relationship with is having a bad day, so I console them. And I don't tell them, well, we should be doing this. I don't need to reprimand. Sometimes I need to reprimand. It's simple things. Taking my dog for a walk and walking up and down the block and just being grateful to do that's very spiritual. Sometimes we're waiting for this thing or Moses to, you know, this voice of Moses come down from the heavens and say, you are touched. Sometimes it's that little niche, that little quiet voice that says, do this, don't do that. It's a very commanding voice, very powerful voice. There's a great story, and uh, I'm probably going to ruin it, but the master is with the students, and he's pointing to the stars. He says, look, the wonder of God, he points to the stars, and all the students sees his master's fingers. He misses the whole thing. And we can do that in recovery. We're looking for this thing, and it's right in front of you in my home group when I'm making coffee for my home group, or cleaning the coffee pot out, or setting up a meeting, or working with the new one at my kitchen table. It's all part of God's work. And when I look for it like that, when I'm in that, those great things will show up. Very interesting how we can do it. I become a landlord of my own kingdom, and I, I make the rules and regulations on what my spiritual life should look like, rather than just being with other drunks. Going to families' houses, not being an embarrassment anymore. Packing into the mainstream is what our book talks about. There's some interesting pretty interesting instructions here. It says this thought brings us to step 10. What thought are they talking about here? As I've cleaned up the wreckage of my past. So if I'm actively making amends and I'm cleaning up that list, it's kind of a sliding into step 10, assuming we're still making amends. But if I have 50 amends to make and I knock out 20 and I kick back, expect to do 10, 11, or 12, it ain't going to happen. I can't enter the world of the spirit with a cognitive mind. I can't do it in an awakened spirit. It's spirit to spirit here. In step 10. Isn't it interesting on how many meetings we don't talk at length about prayer meditation or step 10, what it's like to enter the world of the spirit? Use that for a topic. Tonight's topic, what it's like experientially entering the world of the spirit. You know why? Because how many of us are not doing it? We should have a room of 50, everyone talking about, here's my experience entering the world of the spirit. I clean up amends. This is what my meditations feel like and look like. But it's this thing in the back. It's in September. Don't worry about it. It's in September. You don't need to do that. They just put it in the book to make it look good. Yeah. Right? Uh, there was a, a, an old time is just to say, if you want to hide anything from an alcoholic, put it in the big book. It says, this thought brings us to step 10, which suggests we continue to take personal inventory, continue to set new, uh, write any new mistakes as we go along. We're looking at four through nine here. Continue to take personal inventory, which means I must have taken inventory somewhere. That was in step four. And set right any new mistakes, step nine. Which means I'm going to be seeking counsel with someone, step five. And what do I see in inventory? My defects of character, which move me into my behavior, column four, six and seven. Throughout the day, four, two, nine, four, two, nine, four, two, nine, four, two, nine. That's my walking around step. It says, I vigorously commenced this way of living as I cleaned up the past. Our book uses words like vigorously commenced at once, next, now, action. Nowhere does it say, listen, you did good, hang out. Work on your 90 and 90, you need it. It's always moving. You see a duck on a pond, they're just kind of just moving along gracefully. They're beautiful. Take a look under the water. They're paddling, they're working. This is what we do. We're working. It says, I've entered the world of the spirit. My next function is I don't hang out. I have a function, and that's to grow in understanding and effectiveness. And we always thought, take a statement and flip it into a question. What am I doing currently to grow in understanding and effectiveness? Besides my big book and going to AA, am I doing anything else? If I'm not, and I'm okay, fine. But am I working with other inspirational books along with my big book or not? That's what I've been doing since the get-go in AA. All my teachers were... Uh, uh, Guys who study other books, from scripture to other spiritual books. And not just to read them, but to have an experience with that book. So the book becomes who I be. It says, be quick to see where religious people are right, make use of what they offer. So I don't believe in God. How did I find out drugs work? I, I tried it. 
How do I find out what it makes me feel good? I tried it. But we'll approach this power called God who's keeping me sober with contempt prior to investigation. I'm not going to go near it. But how do you know until you try? It says this is not an overnight matter. It should continue for my lifetime. Here's what I need to do during the day. Continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. Watch. One of the word, of the four words we've worked with in my lineage forever is watch, turn, watch, aware, and observe. Turn, watch, aware, and observe. Turn, watch, aware, and observe. Turn in to this power in order to go out. If I don't turn in, I will go without. But here's the hook. If I turn in too long, you better look out. And what I mean by that one is we can turn to God and worship God and spend time with God, and then we start to really become self-absorbed. Honey, I can't help you with the children. I'm meditating now. The house is burning down, but I got 10 moments of meditation. And I can't do anything else because I need to do this. And really what I'm doing is worshiping me again. But I need to turn in order to go out. Watch your way and observe. Those words are interchangeable. How I'm doing. How's my speech? How's, how's my walk? How am I doing? Constant vigilance. It says, when the, uh, continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. When these things crop up, we ask God at once to remove them. I discuss them with someone immediately and make amends quickly, immediately, quickly. Discuss them with someone immediately, make amends quickly, immediately, quickly. When we want to get high, we do it immediately and quickly, not 90 days. Then I turn my thoughts to someone I can help, and love and tolerance of others is our code. Now watch this. This is where AA will split, depending on where we are. It says we cease fighting anything or anyone, dash, even alcohol. Like alcohol is an afterthought, but by this time, I'm not running away from booze. I'm not running to booze. It's there. I'm here, so be it. I cease fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. So the question is, who am I fighting with in my head? Who am I wrestling with constantly? Me and my mind, me and other people, my into the future regrets about the past. I sit on a couch and I'm restless, irritable, discontented, and no one's around. Kind of like when you're driving over to this meeting all alone and you think you're alone in the car, but if you replay the walk, the drive over here, you were in contact with about 45 other people in your car. No one's in the car. But you're arguing, you're talking, you're figuring stuff out. You're, you're all this stuff going on. You get back in the car, they're all waiting for you. It constantly goes on and on and on. Usually it's not too good. Or you're going to be a CEO of a great, you're going to take over like Facebook. You're going to be the new CEO of Facebook. You'll be worth billions and everyone's going to bow down to me. I'm going to have all these things, right? And then you look at your bank account and say, oh my God, I'm a long way off from that. We go from euphoria to depression. All because the mind's in charge, and I'm talking to all these people. Cease fighting anything or anyone. I remember um, I was watching uh, a knit game, and I was home. I was sitting on the couch, and I realized I had watched an entire four quarter plus halftime of a knit game, basketball game. I had watched the whole four quarters plus halftime of a knit game by myself whole game, by myself, by myself, no phone call, you know, we are cigarette, phone, radio, TV, all at once, right in inventory in the middle of that, all by myself, no phone, the game, a little something to eat, no one around, and when the game ended, it's going about my business, oh my God, I just watched the entire game, and there was no stuff going on in my head, no fighting, no wrestling, no drinking, no nothing. How, how did that happen? The spiritual life makes absolutely no sense based on, based on my track record. It makes no sense. I have to always be doing something. I'll always be busy. I'll always get into some drama. I'll always just something going on. I can't just be alone in perfect peace and ease. I can't go sit on the beach with no phone. I can't do that. I need a phone. I'm, I'm scrolling for hours. You know, contacting, texting. Got to call Joe. We'll see how Joe's doing. Why? Because I can't just sit here and watch Waze for an hour. All by myself. You know why? Because the mind is so busy. It needs to do something. That's just something. And I have found there's something wrong with my spiritual condition. I'm not alone in perfect peace and ease. I'm fighting. I'm wrestling. I'm, I'm delusions of grandeur. i got stuff going on. My mind is still my master. Even though I mask it when I come into a meeting. So I'm good. I'm good. I'm in, I'm, I'm in perfect peace and ease. I share a lot of meetings. I'm great. No, I'm not. 
state of obsessions about a lot of things. Step 10 tells me it's not going to be that way. In fact, if the thoughts come, I don't have to hook into them anymore. Here they come, there they go, here they come, there they go. It's kind of watching like romper room going on in my head. I flip the channel. Love and talents of others is our code. It doesn't mean I let I roll over when things happen. If someone's doing something unacceptable, I have every right to say that's unacceptable. You can't talk to me that way. This behavior is unacceptable. But I don't walk around gossiping about you or criticizing you or critiquing you or, goss- or throwing you under a bus. I just confront you on something that's unacceptable, and then we move on. You and I can di- agree to disagree right now and really go at it. And when it's done, okay, let's move on. We'll go for coffee. You have one, you have another. That's it. Love and talents of others is our code. In the big book, it says, remember, that we're talking about a new person. They are very ill. So new people will come in and sometimes disrupt the meeting. They only know what they know. So I would tell them, no texting. This is unacceptable here. You can't smoke here. But I have to walk around and tell everyone that guy's an idiot. Because now I'm guilty of what I accused you of, being an idiot. And the other thing I found, if I'm sponsoring myself, my sponsor's not too healthy. And speaking that, and I speak from out, dude, I do this a lot. This is one little piece of my journey in recovery. And I said this from a million podiums. If God removed me from a podium, says no more speaking, I'll sit in the back and I'll be okay. But this should not be what I do for recovery. This is one piece of it. What I do is when I'm away from the podium, my worship with God, my cleaning up amends, my trying to make my house into a home, make a loving home, a safe home, you know place that you want to be at. And hopefully treat my workers and the people who work with me and for me as men with respect. And it all comes from this powerful God. It's all about living in step 10. How am I doing? My sponsor Mark would always say, how am I doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? It says, for by this time sanity will have returned. I will seldom be interested in liquor. If tempted, I recoil from it as from a hot flame. I react sanely and normally, and I find that this has happened automatically so much for having to think the dream through. My book just told me this same rational thinking happens automatically based on my spiritual condition. I don't have to play the tape to the end, remember where I come from, keep it green. That's all my broken mind trying to figure out how to fix itself. It's not going to take me to the right place. At some point, it'll say, you know what, a double looks good right now, why not? You, you, you can drink safely. You should seek vengeance on that person. You should gossip. After all, this is justified gossip. Look what they did to me. In another book, it says, and I'll paraphrase, if they come into your house and steal, give them everything and then turn the other cheek. Don't seek vengeance. Don't take them to court. Water and water. Yet how many times in AA I claim to be spiritual, but if you double-cross me, you gossip about me, I'm out for you. I'll gossip more about you because you gossip once about me. It's justified. No, it's not. Not in the spiritual world. It's about all forgiveness and all love and no opposite. What an order. Here's the narrow road, man. But at the end of the day, guess who's sleeping at night? Guess who's free and able to wear, wear the world like a loose garment? It says, we, I will see that my new attitude towards liquor has been given us, given to me without any thought or effort on my part. No thought equals total peace equals freedom. No thought, no thinking equals total peace equals freedom. When I'm not thinking, I'm great. When I don't have my own thoughts going around, I am free. And I'm, I'm moved by that intuitiveness or dependence upon God. And my book says God gave me a brain to use to figure stuff out. As long as I'm thinking, I'm probably self-seeking. As long as I have thoughts going on, there's probably some fear in there. If I have thoughts and thinking going on, there's probably some ego in there. I'm not so open to criticism, constructive criticism. And I'm seeking vengeance on people who want vengeance on me. That's all my thinking. It's all my ego. It's all this wonderful predator called a thinking mind, which has no, there's no room for the mind in 10 and 11. You don't need it. One of my teachers would say, you don't need a mind. Not now. Planning a vacation? Okay, now we have proper use of the will. How much money? Where am I going? Do I have to pack enough stuff? Etc. Proper use of the will. Other than that, I really don't need to think. For example, if anything I'm saying so far is annoying you and making you uncomfortable, it's not me trying to make anyone uncomfortable. 
It's the mind and the thinking saying, why is he talking about this stuff? Well, I, don't, I don't like this. I disagree with this. Who does he think he is anyway? Guess who's doing the talking? Ego. Guess who's doing the talking? The mind. Guess who's doing the talking? My illness. Oh, I can't learn from, I'm, I'm a Catholic. I can't learn from the rabbi. He's, he's not a Catholic. Guess who's doing the talking? And vice versa. Contempt pride investigation. Step 10 clears me out of all of this. It tells me, uh, this is the miracle of it. I'm not fighting, nor am I avoiding temptation. I feel as though I've been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. I haven't even sworn the stuff off or the things that were haunting me for the longest time. Instead, the problem has been removed. It doesn't exist for me. I'm recovered. The thing that was at me, the symptom of this great problem, alcohol, and the other things that were under the surface that were at me all the time and determined everything I thought, felt, saw, did, are no longer there. I'm in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. The problem has been removed. I'm in a place called recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. It's a guarantee. It's a promise. <clears throat> Back in step 10, they talked about... Uh, uh, came to believe the power granted myself to restore me to sanity. And here in September, he says, here's sanity. They give it to you on a silver platter as a result of four through nine. It's a guarantee. Spiritual transformation, my book, is guaranteed. There's no, well, you might get one. Let's see what happens. Let's hope for the best. Or someone told me today, hanging in there. Right? We don't have to hang in there. My sponsor called me up years ago, about, I don't know, five, six in the morning. He said, how you doing, money? He just called me money. How you doing, money? He said, Mark, I'm hanging in there. He read me the line after the next half hour about hang, hanging in there. You belong to AA, you're upright, sober, second air, and you have the glory of God in your life. You're hanging in there. What did we miss? But we will settle for, I'm hanging in there. Because I'm not rich yet, so I'm hanging in there. I don't have a new Rolls Royce, so I'm hanging in there. I went to my home group, I don't like anybody, so I'm hanging in there. Step 10 is about opening up the doors, the spiritual path. Now, that narrow road, here's my experience, very narrow road, very, very narrow gate to which I'm going to pass. Something happens that in the narrowing of this road, this world, this life gets huge. I'm not plagued by me anymore, my thinking. At times I am. But in that narrowing of the road, if I stay on that path, something opens up that's huge, it's vast, it's abundant. A lot of it is God. You can feel it. You go down to the beach and you look at the sun. Uh, as the sun's coming up, it's God. Sun setting God. Look at the dog. Look at your children. Look at the wife. I mean, whatever it is. Look, it's God all over the place. I ate three times today. It's God. There's a time when I had a boost, a pack of Twinkies, every couple of days to eat. That was my diet. I think about where I was a bunch of years ago, and, and I, I'm not making this up. I, I, before I got thrown out of this little apartment that I wasn't paying rent in, and I brought all sorts of unsavory characters in there, I remember up in the uh, a cabinet where you would normally have food, I had what was left of a box of spaghetti. I don't know how long it was up there. And a box of domino sugar cubes. I don't even know how to got there. Probably when I moved in, my dad put all that stuff in, so I ate and um, my diet consisted, this before I was homeless, I would take a handful of those, those spaghetti, break them in half, put them in a the pocket, a handful of sugar cubes, put them in the other pocket. And that's what I would eat during the day. Stale spaghetti and a handful of sugar cubes. That was the diet. Now, I had the same clothes on that I would crash out with the night before I just get up and walk out the door. There was no, like, you know, bathing and brushing your teeth and fixing your hair and putting on clean clothes. It was just an excess. There were laundry piled all over the floor, just a pile of laundry. And brandy bottles all over the floor and garbage that was overflow. I mean, just think about it, all over the floor. I mean, it's so odd. I, I can't deal with this now because I'm waking up like this, and the first thing I gotta do, I gotta get a drink in me. I don't know if anybody does, identifies with this, but you hold the bottle like this, and you bring it up to you, and it drinks, and you, it comes up, you puke it up, because it's poison, and then you try it one more time, and boom, it stays down, and then, oh, okay, then the hands are stopping, and I gotta keep drinking here. This isn't like one or two, and I go to work. Now, I had to sneak out and sneak back in, because I was back on rent. My landlord was looking for me, so you find ways to climb into a very narrow window in the back, figure out how to get in the door without making it sweet because if you find you, you can call the cops. This is how you live. And this is before it got worse. 
So I come into Alcoholics Anonymous and they give me some spiritual disciplines to work with and I like the effect produced by God. I like the effect produced by sobriety because I don't live like, I don't live anything like that anymore. It's almost this other guy who took me over. This possession that went on in my life and the, the, the reality is I can be back there tonight because I'm the type of drunk I pick up a drink I'm in a dumpster tonight suit and all. There's no gradual decline in this. Some of us have a gradual decline. Me, I blow up. I'm on a mission in five minutes. That guy scares me. I don't want no part of that. I hope he's dead for good and all, because he was trying to do it. But we come into this place called the sunlight of the spirit. Everything changes, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. But when God shows up, God shows up. I was driving home. I was uh, marketing for treatment center years ago. And I'm working with my sponsor. We just came through the work. And uh, I'm doing new 10 and 11 stuff. I'm working with some spiritual books along with my book. And um, <clears throat> I'm driving back from way out in PA back to Jersey. And I'm just driving back. There's a PA turnpike. And out of nowhere, God burst upon me. You know what I'm talking Just you get a shot of God. And I'm just driving in a van after a full day. Two-hour drive, two-hour drive back. And I'm exhausted and I'm tired and I'm hungry. And I'm driving and boom. And suddenly, I got tears rolling down my eyes. I'm euphoric. Because I worked. I did a full day's work. I did a good day's work. I'm self-supporting. No one's after me. All my bills are paid. I'm going to home group tonight. What a great day. I'm going to go home and have a meal. I'm going to take a nice hot shower, put on clean clothes in a warm house. This is great. God. Sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. When God shows up, God shows up. You can be in the supermarket. You can be with your children. You can be doing anything. And suddenly there's this thing that you know God's walking with you. And there is no doubt in that moment. And very often when we're in the presence of this power, we weep. It's that powerful. And if you've been there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Here come tears. And not sorrow tears. They're, they're euphoric. They're joyful. Standing in the presence of this great power. And no one is outside that circle. There's no one more special. There's no one who deserves it. Everyone is the same in, in his eyes. Just when the ground's fertile, he will deliver. And if I think about the worst moment in my life, personally, next to my mom dying, was June 23rd, 1988, when I woke up. I wasn't planning to stop drinking that day. This is another day of terror, another day of torment and hell. And something happened in that day, early in that day, where the curse of due battle was completely removed, and I went and called on God. And in that awful, terrible time, God burst upon us. Bill talks about it laying in, 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 in the hospital bed. He was not sponsorship material. He was at the bottom of the bottom that they were going to be committed somewhere. Boom, here comes God. That's how God works. It's kind of like love and death. You don't expect it, and when it happens, it's life-changing. You can't plan it. But there it is. And that's how God works. And it keeps me right size. Because I know if I do this, I'll have this Moses moment. So I'm doing it for the wrong reason. I do this not to die. I do this not to pick up a drink. I do this to experience God. And in his time, he will show up. And it's always, it's always that kind of power. It's always that kind of life-changing, mood-altering God. In step 10. And what I get to do in step 11 is nurture that, get my soul food. Um, my sponsor would ask me a question. Uh, these questions always came between 5 and 6 o'clock in the morning. He would call me. And he was usually just out of meditation, which I can tell. And after a while, I used to get a notepad and pen, and he would just go before we got to my stuff. And he would say to me, money, did you eat today? And he would say, why did you eat today if you ate yesterday? And I had no idea what he was talking about. And he pressed me and he pushed me. Well, if I don't eat today, I'll get hungry. Then what? I'll get sick. And then what? I'll die. He, exactly. He's, what are you doing for your soul food today? What kind of, how much God are you taking in today? What are you doing to carry the vision of God's will to your activities? You need to get your soul food every day. I can't rely on all the experience I had a year ago, five years ago to be sober today. That gets old quick. I get stale. I get stagnant. I get dusty. I get frail. I get sick. I get drunk. So what am I doing every day? Our book says every day we must carry the vision of God's will to all my activities. Step 10 says a kindly act once in a while isn't enough. I must act the good Samaritan every day. 24-hour clips. What am I doing for God? 
not for me, for God. And really, as messenger of God, I'm not here to be served anymore. I've been served in abundance, but to serve. And there's something that comes to me. Whoever last shall be first. Sometimes I need a banquet to be grateful. I don't need a banquet. Need a lot of money to be grateful, feel spiritual. I don't, I don't have a lot of money. Everyone around me seems to be rich, but not me. <laughs> Surrounded by trust fund babies, I don't get it. I need a new car. I have a new car. I don't need it to be spiritual. It's a, what a good gift. What a, what a good deal. I drive around a new car. I used to drive around the moving violation. I mean, no license, no tags, crack windshield. Out of a car with a floorboard, you could see the concrete underneath as you're driving. It's like the Flintstones vehicle. And when the cops would pull you over, say, "What? What's the problem?" <laughs> and meatballs are not meatballs. <laughs> I'm going to gossip about him after the meeting. Okay. <laughs> Okay. How are we doing on time? Okay, it's a couple more things. It says it's easy to let up on my spiritual uh, uh, program of action and rest on my laurels. I had to look up the word laurels because I didn't know what that meant. I was not the brightest bulb in the box. Laurels, my accomplishments of yesterday, the good things I did an hour ago, the spiritual experience I had a year ago. I can't rest on that. It's constant vigilance, growing or I'm going. It tells me I'm headed for trouble if I do rest on my laurels. Go out goes a subtle foe. Again, I didn't know what subtle and foe meant. I looked up the di- in the dictionary. Subtle, sly, clever, devious, difficult to detect. A foe is my personal enemy. It's pursuing me. And if I don't continue to seek on, it'll pull me right back. It doesn't care how long I'm sober. I've been faced with some thunderbolts over the years. Divorce, near bankruptcy twice. You get married, wedding bliss, and then suddenly go to divorce, and they're taking everything you own, including your own breath. Everything. And you go to your bank account, there's no money. I went to my bank account, there was no, no money. They took everything. My house was gone. Everything. And I was, I was out of work, I was unemployed. What, well, okay, God, what do I do now? How am I doing then, spiritually? Who am I turning to? Is it God or another heart? I'm not cured of apples. What I have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual condition. Every day is a day I must carry the vision of God's will into all my activities. How can I best serve God? His will, not mine, be done. It tells me these thoughts must go with me constantly. We can exercise our will power along this line. It's the proper use of the will. There's a difference between proper use of the will and my will. Proper use of the will is everything God has given me, throw it at this project, throw it at this person, throw it at this talk, throw it at my work. He's given me some gifts, given us all some gifts. Go for it. That's proper use of the will. Trying to raise your children, you do the best you can. Have in a relationship with someone, you want to be the best you can for them and, and bring them love and things like that. You want to bring something to it. Proper use of the will. It's fueled with love. My will is self-seeking, self-serving. And the difference between my will and God's will, I know what God's I know what my what God's will isn't. I know what my will is. Usually God's will is free and easy. Sometimes it's uncomfortable. My will, stress, anxiety, fear, worried about the outcome, projection, ego, self-serving, self-seeking is a payoff to me. Gotta figure it out. God's will usually we just move right in front of us. Do you ever like say things to someone that you say, where did that come from? Boy, that was good. You work with someone and there's this thing that happens because you really want to help them. And you're throwing all your years' experience at this new person. And things start to pop. All gone. Because I'm in there for the right reason. But if I'm in there for the wrong reason, I now have to figure stuff out. How am I going to do this? I'll do this so they don't do that. There's all of this. We become the director again. And that's fueled by fear. And that's not a sense of ease and comfort. That's restless, irritable, discontented. We have an opportunity, I have an opportunity to be in AA and be joyous, happy, and free as my big book tells me they want us to be. So if I'm experiencing freedom right now, how free do I want to get? Do I want to get freer? And if I'm sitting in a meeting or meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous and I'm experiencing bondage, why? I have an abundance of stuff, abundance of folks, an abundance of God, and we come to AA like I did in my first six months and I'm rolled up tighter than a baseball. 
going off the handle any minute. They're talking about me, and we can be joyous, happy, and free. Step 10, my walking around what I'm doing, making amends quickly, being accountable to someone, my inventory throughout the day. And when I get home at night, I sit down and review my day and put it all on paper. We're out of time. That's all I got. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.